Gary wrote a bunch of things on Wilt, but he wrote a best-selling book called Wilt 1962, The Night of 100 Points and the Dawn of a New Era. He joins me now on the Circuit Resort and Casino Hotline. <laughs> Circuit Resort and Casino in Las Vegas, home of the world's largest sports book. Gary, thanks so much for joining me. I appreciate it. Oh, it's a pleasure to be on with you, Lawrence. I really love looking at Wilt Chamberlain's stats because they they seem like they're not real. And the one of the stats that I bring up all the time is him averaging 48 and a half minutes in, in 1962, which to me is insane. Like all, all of his numbers from that era are insane. Like as you've gone back and gone through the, and studied Wilt Chamberlain, what is the most fascinating thing about his game statistically for you? Well, just what you mentioned. I mean, particularly today in a time of time management for players, people say, well, anybody score 100 points in a game again? My question is, can anyone average more than 48 minutes, which is the full game, as Will did? Now, Will's coach was Frank McGuire. And Will told Frank McGuire, Frank, I can't help this team if I'm sitting on the bench. So McGuire said, all right, Will T, you'll play every minute of every game. And he, he did. There were a few overtime games, including a triple overtime game that season. So he averaged 48 and a half minutes a game. He missed eight minutes and 33 seconds of the entire season when the referee Norm Drucker threw him out because Wilt had said an unkind word about the referee Earl Strom's mother. <laughs> well, uh, that's, that's usually something that will kick you, get you kicked out of the game. It's weird to me. Like it almost seems like Wilt Chamberlain's basketball career was mythology. Because even when you start looking at the the Elgin Baylors and and Bill Russells and look at their numbers, which were also astounding, the stuff that Wilt was doing, it felt like he was from another planet. So what were the things that made him so far above his, his rivals when it came to his individual play? Well, the first thing is when you, you think about Wilt, you have to put aside this idea of the old muscled up guy in the yellow headband playing for the Lakers. In Hershey, Pennsylvania... 1962, when Wilt scored 100 points, it was a very different Wilt. It was the 25-year-old Wilt, 7'1", 260 pounds. He ran the floor like a train and, you know, had a massive back, a 31-inch waist. You know, he was a decathlete. Lawrence, I'd go so far to say that if you judge athleticism purely on the criteria of size, speed, strength, and agility, than the young Will Chamberlain. That Will Chamberlain might have been the greatest pure athlete of the 20th century, and if not, at least he's in the conversation. I think it's important to know that. Why do you think that when we have the conversations about the greatest players of the game, we, we list Michael Jordan, we talk about Kobe Bryant, we talk about LeBron James, and sometimes we even talk about Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Why don't we talk about Wilt in that way? Well historical illiteracy comes to mind, um, a lack of appreciation for what Will did for the NBA. I mean, with all due respect to Michael Jordan and his greatness, I think Michael Jordan's greatness is secure. He cannot be as historically important as Will Chamberlain by virtue of the different periods in which they played. By the time Michael got into the NBA, the league had been resuscitated by Magic and Bird. The league was doing just fine, and Michael helped it do better. When Wilt comes into the NBA in 1959, the NBA is like a lounge act. It was a league in search of itself. It wasn't really a national association. There was only one team west of St. Louis, the Lakers, who had moved there a year before. And into this sort of carnival strides Will Chamberlain. In this year you're talking about, 1961-62, Wilt scored 40 points a game against Bill Russell, arguably the greatest defensive center ever. So when you ask how did it happen, why did it happen, Wilt was that good. And, and when, you know, you, you think about how would this player do if you moved him into the present day, oh, I think if we moved 25-year-old Wilt Chamberlain into the NBA today, he would do just fine. I think you're right about that. I, I, I now let's talk about the 100 point night because you've done a whole book on this. That you, you, how did it come to pass that Wilt would score 100 points in one game? Well, Wilt averaged 
50 points a game that season. These are comic book superhero numbers, right? 50 points a game. 50.4 was the exact number. So 43 times that season, he scored more than 50 points in a game. So in Hershey, he's playing the last place New York Knicks. The Knicks had already given up 63 points in a game to Jerry West of the Lakers earlier that season. They'd given up 71 to Elgin Baylor the year before. They just weren't very good. The Knicks had two six foot ten inch centers. One, Daryl M. Hoff, was a rookie. He had won a gold medal with the U.S. Olympic team in 1960 at the Rome Olympics. But M. Hoff, that night in Hershey, fouled out after playing just 20 minutes. Now, the other six foot ten inch center wasn't going to help much because he wasn't even in the arena. He was 13 miles away at the Hotel Penn Harris in Harrisburg, the state capital, vomiting because of a late-night bender the night before. So Phil Jordan, he's not going to be a factor. That means for 28 of the 48 minutes that night in Hershey, the tallest player the Knicks had to defend Wilt was a six foot eight inch rookie, Cleveland Buckner, who was kind of built like a flagpole, didn't have much weight on him. And so, the, you know, nobody knew that Wilt was – where he was with his point total, because it's not a day where you look up on the big board above the court and say, oh, number 13, big fella, you know, 77 points. They didn't have those then. They just had an old metallic uh, scoreboard used for the Hershey Bears hockey team. But when there's seven and a half minutes to play, Wilt scores and he's fouled. And Harvey Pollack, the statistician for the Philadelphia Warriors, Wilt's team, gives Dave Zinkoff, the PA announcer, a sheet of paper that says Wilt has just broken his own scoring record. So at that point, Zinkoff announced it. Ladies and gentlemen, a new scoring record has been created by Wilt Chamberlain. He has 79 points. And then he makes those two free throws, so now he's got 81. And at that moment, everybody suddenly has context. and Everything becomes intensified. For Wilt's warriors, it's a sense of curiosity that's intensified. Can the big fella actually do this? His high had been 78 points in a triple overtime game earlier that season. For the Knicks, the poor last place Knicks, it's their sense of dread, Lawrence, that intensifies. They're thinking, if this guy scores 100 points, people are going to be talking about this in 60 years. And we are, and he did. So this game wasn't televised, right? There was no television at all on this? No TV at all, and um, there were just, none of the New York sports writers came down. It was game 75 out of 80, so the, the Warriors were too far behind Red Auerbach and, and uh, Bill Russell Celtics to catch them. The Knicks were going to finish last, so it was just playing out the string, and it was Wilt muscling up. You see, Wilt muscled up when he, when he wanted to. Like when he played against Walt Bellamy for the first time that season, Walt Bellamy, the great rookie for the Chicago Packers, they meet for the first time in the International Amphitheater in Chicago. And, and so as Will got charged up to play Oscar Robertson and Elgin Baylor and Russell, now it's Walt Bellamy. And Bellamy could appear formal. He comes out to half court for the opening tip and says, hello, Mr. Chamberlain, I'm Walter Bellamy. Will extends his hand and shakes him and says, hello, Walter. You won't get a shot off in the first half. And he blocks Bellamy's first nine shots from inside the free throw line that night. Bellamy couldn't shoot. He couldn't breathe. He was in shell shock. And he comes out for the second half tip and Will says to Bellamy, okay, Walter, now you can play. Wow. And he outscored Bellamy 51 to 14 that night in a Warriors win. Will was just that kind of guy. He was 7-1 and his ego was bigger. Remember, you're not going to score 100 points without an ego. You have to not only want to do it, you have to, on a deeper level, need to do it. And this was Will bending not just the team, but an entire sport to his will in Hershey. Did, did his teammates want him to get, like, did they actively help him get the 100 points? Well, the answer is yes, particularly in the last seven and a half minutes when, it, when the game became kind of a Kind of a joke because what happened is the Knicks start running a weave. They're stalling. They're, you know, they're 20 points behind and they're stalling because they don't want Will to get the ball and, and, and score. And, and the Warriors counter by putting in some reserves to foul the Knicks quickly to get the ball back to Wilt. So the game takes on sort of this 
caricature of a real game. Huh. But the thing is, Lawrence, you know, this game should not be seen as a carnival act. This game had real meaning, real symbolism. Because what Will Chamberlain did that entire season by averaging 50 points a game and by throwing down that 100-point thunderbolt in Hershey was to symbolically blow apart the racial quota that NBA owners had at that time that limited the number of black players to just a few per team. NBA owners felt, you know, if, if there were too many black players on a team, whatever that meant, then white fans wouldn't come to games. This was also a time when NBA owners felt that if you televised the game, none of the local fans would show up. They had some learning to do in a lot of different ways. And that night was a statement by Wilt, a statement that said the NBA will be a white man's enclave no longer. Gary Pomerantz is joining me. You should check out his book. Because he's written extensively about Wilt Chamberlain. Wilt 1962, the night of 100 points and the dawn of a new era. Gary, did people believe that he had scored 100 points? Well, this, again, it's, you know, when Kobe scored 81 in 2006, 15 minutes after the game, you could go online and buy a DVD of his performance. When Wilt scored 100, it was like the mighty oak fell in the forest in the middle of the night and no one saw it or heard it. You know, it had been prophesied that he would score 100 points in a game, you know, if, if the planets aligned. And in answer to your earlier question, his teammates did go along with it. And they, they got him the ball. And, and I think people don't consider that for, for someone to score 100 points, his teammates have to be willing accomplices. They have to subvert their egos and say, Let's see if this can happen. And and 100, I mean, you know, it's like Kobe at 81 went to the moon and Wilt at 100. He went to, he went to Mars. It, the whole thing to me is amazing. The iconic photo of him holding up a piece of paper with 100. How did that happen? Well, there was a professional photographer who was there at the game that night for the local Harrisburg paper, but he apparently had a lot of events to cover that night and left after the first quarter there was no (laughs) he missed something didn't he yes Um, yes he did (laughs) like history um but there was an off-duty associated press photographer there named paul bathis and he was there with his son on his 10th birthday he took his son there as a birthday present now bathis wasn't just any photographer the year before He had won a Pulitzer Prize for a photo he took of the young president, John Kennedy, walking with the former president, Dwight Eisenhower, along. They were walking along a path at Camp David, and it was shot from behind. It was, you know, a beautiful photograph, and he wins the Pulitzer Prize. So at the end of the third quarter in Hershey, when Wilt's got 69 points, Bathus tells his son, you stay right here. I'm going out to the car, get my camera from the trunk. And thank goodness he did, because he came back and stationed himself beneath one of the baskets. I think he said he only had 20 photos left in his camera to to use that night. In the post-game locker room, he went in, and and this is, you know, a a little uh, locker room. It's antiquated. There's just a solitary bench there, and Wilt's sitting there, and uh, the Baptist says to Harvey Pollock, the statistician and publicist and do-everything kind of guy for the Warriors, Harvey, can I get a picture of Wilt? And Harvey says, let's see. Yeah, yeah, what can we do? And he gets a sheet of paper and writes. It looked like a Sharpie. I don't even know if the Sharpies existed then. But he writes 100 and hands it to Wilt and said, Wilt, hold this. You know, we've all seen this photograph, right? It's a black and white photograph. And it, I, I would encourage your listeners to go back and stare at it again and and just stare at it for a few moments because – you know, you can see that behind Wilt, there's two hooks on the wall. He's got his trousers and his jacket. His knees on this little bench are up in his chest. He's got his good luck rubber band on his wrist. He's soaked in sweat, and he's got this sheepish grin. And, Lawrence, it might be the greatest basketball photo ever taken. And it wasn't even taken on the court. This was just Wilt in his element, on his night, the night he scored 100 points. 
when you saw DeMar DeRozan have his name attached to Will Chamberlain because he goes on this incredible streak of games where he scores 35 or more and he does it on 50% shooting and it hadn't been done since Wilt done, had done it. How, how proud should DeMar DeRozan be to have his name attached to something that Wilt Chamberlain didn't do? Well, very proud. I mean, that's quite an accomplishment today. Uh, it's a, quite an accomplishment at any time. Uh, and, you know, DeRozan is a fine player. But Wilt Chamberlain was a seminal player. He was a timeless player. Oscar Robertson has said, and I agree with this, that Wilt Chamberlain saved the NBA single-handedly when it needed saving in the early 60s. He was the guy that people wanted to see, the guy who scored 100 points in a game. We've all heard the famous line from the Boston Red Sox star Ted Williams, we used to say when he walked down the street, he wanted people to point at him and say, there goes the greatest hitter who ever lived. Well, Wilt did not initially embrace the 100-point game. Um, in fact, it took decades for him to really comprehend what it was about. He thought it just fed the notion that he was an individualist interested only in his statistics. But he came to see how much it meant to other people. And part of it is the symbolism of 100. If he scored 98 or even 102, it just wouldn't have stayed with us as much. There's a, you know, a symmetry. A yeah, I mean, in our culture, it's a perfect score on a test, 100 or a century. Um, and and so this was, this was, you know, the young Will putting his stamp, his his signature on the game. 